Hi, I'm KWLH K, and today I will share with you my thoughts on Occupy Central, also known in Cantonese as Jimling Zhongwan. As you may know, for the past week or so, Hong Kong is experiencing a lot of social unrest caused by the Occupy Central movement. A large number of protesters against the proposed election format of the Hong Kong chief executive in 2017 have literally occupied large parts of the city's commercial areas, having constant sit-ins at places like Admiralty, Causeway Bay, Tim Sha Tsui and Mong Kok, disrupting the operations of the government with the aim that the government take back its proposal. The whole thing started as a result of the proposed method by which the uh, chief executive would be elected in 2017. Not well, everyone over the age of 18 can cast a vote on their preferred candidate. The candidates themselves can only be nominated by a 1,200 strong committee handpicked by the uh, Communist Party of China, which is the main point of controversy. The event started when a group of students boycotting school, also the government headquarters in protest, suddenly charged into a restricted area under instructions from Joshua Wong, Wang Zifeng, leader of the student group Scholarism, Hotman Zitu. Scuffles with the police followed, which quickly spread out to the main road, Harcourt Road, outside the headquarters. More and more protesters joined in, breaking through the lines set by the police, which then used tear gas shortly afterwards, but with little effect. So Admiralty is now taken over, with over 10,000 people sitting in on the road, with the shopping and commercial districts of Mong Kok, Causeway Bay and Tim Sha Tsui following soon after. The protesters, mainly led by Scholarism and the Federation of Students, Ho Lun, and Occupy Central, demanded the current chief executive, Leung Chan Ying, Leung Zhen Ying, or simply CY, to resign and that true democratic elections be held where virtually anyone can stand for election if they receive enough nominations from the people. However, the main problem here is that hardly any other country in the world uses this system. For instance, in the United States, the presidential candidates from both main parties, who almost always wins, have to be chosen by a series of primaries. So it is not a matter of how many random citizens wanting to nominate the person to stand for president. Also, there's a national security issue with this uh, so-called civic nomination system. What if enough people nominate a candidate that has links to other countries against Chinese interests and this person wins? That candidate would essentially be constantly at loggerheads with the central government being a puppet of uh, whatever uh, hostile country that they represent. Hong Kong, while enjoying a high degree of autonomy, is still a part of China, so I think that the people should not overestimate the amount of say they have in running their own affairs, since ultimately the Chinese government has the final veto power on uh, your policies. In addition, that government has stated that this election proposal is already the first and final offer and nothing would change that. So if the proposal gets vetoed by the Legislative Council, people would have to wait until 2022 before they can elect their own chief executive and probably the system would still be the same. If the students really feel righteous enough, they should travel all the way to Beijing to protest and see what happens. I have heard people around me saying that the police were wrong to use tear gas on the protesters on the first day. However, when you enter a government area where you're not supposed to be in, you would really expect the police to stop you. Right? Now, these protesters are threatening to take over government buildings. Since there are so many of them, the police really have no choice but to use tear gas to keep them back, given how outnumbered they were. Otherwise, the headquarters will be taken over, a lot of go important government work will be suspended, and the city will be completely paralysed, which is of course the aim of the protesters. Besides, tear gas alone is not even that deadly compared to, say, beating them with batons and sticks and other things. All tear gas does is to make it harder to see and breathe for a few hours, and that's about it. 
it's only people who have conditions like asthma that may be at risk. And of course, you really wouldn't want to be uh, protesting violently if you have such respiratory conditions. Furthermore, it should be noted that Occupy Central is an illegal protest. In Hong Kong, all protests and demonstrations must be applied for in advance. Since they have not obtained permission to organize these protests, these protesters are breaking the law. In addition, they are obstructing the roads by the sit-ins, which is against the law as well. I understand that these protesters may have their own ideals, but this does not change the fact that they are breaking the law. And of course, in real life, if you break the law, don't be surprised when the police come after you. So the sit-ins continued for a week, covering the National Day on the October the 1st, with the police seemingly powerless to stop them. Protesters barricaded themselves in areas they have taken over and blocked entrances to MTL stations. Of course, you should have seen uh, some of my videos by Ride the MTL. School was suspended for the Central and Western and Wan Chai districts, while everyday life was disrupted, with the MTL not stopping at Admiralty, for instance. So what were the police doing? They may seem helpless, since any attempts at violently clashing with protesters will be seen as police brutality by some biased local press and the whole world that is now watching them. However, one important fact is that the protesters are disrupting the everyday lives of a lot of people in Hong Kong. Normally, during the National Day week, retailers typically expect bumper sales from tourists from the mainland. Ironically, which these protesters like to refer to as locusts or Wong Tong, as they say it in Cantonese. This year, a lot of provinces have cancelled tours in Hong Kong as a result of these protests. And it is reported that the revenue has dropped by over 70% for many of these retailers in the popular shopping areas, which result in severe losses. Given the high rents and tight margins these business owners face, this is obviously a big blow to them. After all, probably the profits from this so-called Golden Week alone could cover a large majority of the annual targets. In addition, there's also a saying in Hong Kong that to stop someone from earning a living is no different to murdering one's parents. Also take into the account the local residents who spent helpless sleepless nights due to the noise from the protests and all the workers who have had to spend many hours traveling to work due to the traffic disruptions. Also, take note of the amount of videos online showing the nasty sides of the protesters, like stopping a lady cleaner from working in the government HQ and obstructing ambulances just in case they're used to smuggle police equipment. All of this leads to an increasing number of angry people who are against these protests as well. And as, as expected, these anti-Occupy protesters started attacking the occupiers of Mong Kok in an attempt to drive them out, which indirectly led to the protesters leaving Tim Sha Tsui with Canton Road outside the Harbour City shopping mall being reopened to traffic. In addition, the police have reopened parts of Causeway Bay as of Friday, October the 3rd, taking advantage of a time when there are very few protesters in the particular area. Some accuse the tribes of getting involved and possibly paid for by the police, but consider this, there are a large number of nightclubs, saunas, massage parlors, brothels and so on run by tribes. And naturally, the protests were, are ruining the business. Angry shopkeepers are one thing, but angry tribes, on the other hand, well, you don't really need me to explain it, right? As it currently stands, there are still many protesters in Admiralty, some in Causeway Bay and fighting and some fighting in Mong Kok. However, it should be noted that a number of academics, the Chancellor of the University of Hong Kong, teacher and student and parent groups, and even scholarism and the Federation of Students themselves have started to ish advise students to leave the protest areas for their own safety. And even the Chief Executive CY has insisted that the area outside the government HQ should be cleared by Monday. Whether this is the final warning to a crackdown remains to be seen. Whatever happens, 
I hope Hong Kong realizes that it is getting less and less important in China from an economic and strategic point of view. With cities like Shenzhen and Shanghai being rapidly developed and overtaking it. If this infighting and instability continues, the central government will simply support Hong Kong less, and that, in addition to foreign investments being withdrawn and reduced tourism income, will cripple the economy, making life hard for everyone. I understand that property prices and retail prices are ridiculously high, and some are forced to live in tiny subdivided flats due to this. But I can assure you, things can get even worse. Soon you might even be begging those so-called locusts that you hate so much to spend the hard-earned money on you. It might sound harsh, but in real life, market forces trump government systems. While many secondary school and university students tend to have ideals and would like to change the world, they should understand that the world is more complicated than what they think it is, and they will find out how tough things are in real life once they start work. Whatever happens, I wish Hong Kong good luck and stability in the future. Thank you for listening and I'll see you later.